And my name is John Noguera. I am the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder at Sigma Excel. We're going to uh, introduce DiscoverSim, our new Monte Carlo simulation and optimization tool. So we'll introduce DiscoverSim. We will uh, talk about Monte Carlo simulation, stochastic global optimization, and then uh, two case studies, a mechanical engineering case study, robust design of shutoff valve spring force uh, by Andy Sleeper, and a case study on catapult variation reduction. When we talk about design for Six Sigma, one of the things that we talk about is uh, robust design and variation reduction. And of course, an important tool to get there is the design of experiments. And the design of experiments gives us a y equals f of x, a transfer function. And we can play with the x's to determine what they need to be in order to achieve the desired y. One of the things, though, that we don't get uh, from a straight DOE analysis is the uncertainty. What if we have uncertainty in the x's? What if we are not able to control those x's perfectly and we have some variability in the x's? And this is where Monte Carlo simulation comes into play and allows you to model the uncertainty in the x's so that you can observe what happens in the y's. And then you can take that, uh, take that uncertainty into account. Furthermore, you can actually set your input x's to minimize the impact of the variation. And that's where optimization comes in. So one is to quantify the uncertainty. And then secondly is to minimize the uncertainty or minimize the, the effect of that uncertainty. And DiscoverSim will help you to do that. Uh, DiscoverSim is a new product by Sigma Excel. And we have made effort to tailor or to really focus on the Six Sigma audience uh, rather than using terms like assumptions and uh, forecasts and decision variables. We talk about input distributions, input controls, and output responses. We have a, a large library of distributions. There are 53 continuous distributions, 10 discrete distributions, and we have automatic best fit for all of those. You can specify correlations between inputs. It's fast. We have a, an Excel spreadsheet interpreter that uses Gauss, which is a, a matrix language. And essentially, what we do is we export the Excel model uh, into Gauss and do the number crunching in Gauss and then bring the results back into Excel. And that results in speed increases up to 40, uh, up to 40 fold. Now, now I, I'm not going to do an in-depth competitive analysis, but we, we have a document uh, called Migrating from Crystal Ball to DiscoverSim. And that'll be distributed to all the attendees. And in it, I talk about the the kind of the nuances or the subtleties of differences between Crystal Ball and Discover Sim. We have uh, sensitivity analysis. You can use either correlation or stepwise regression. Stepwise regression, you can actually include interaction terms and quadratic terms. We have very powerful global optimization, which I'll talk about. Uh, with that global optimization, it's stochastic, so you can minimize DPM, maximize PPK and you can put constraints in. So stochastic global optimization, we have uh, three methodologies, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Direct dividing rectangles, uh, genetic algorithm, and sequential quadratic programming. And we actually we have a hybrid of those three methodologies that make for very powerful optimization. And then I mentioned the Gauss engine, which is what we use to accelerate uh, the, the Excel calculations. And also, one of the things that we get is a very powerful random number generator, much better than the random number generator that's uh, in Crystal Ball. It has a much longer period, and, and it's uh, proven to not have uh, built-in serial correlation, which is important uh, when you're doing Monte Carlo simulation and making business decisions you know, on the assumption that uh, you're getting good simulation. We have lots of distributions. I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to go into all the distributions, but 
we have them broken out in common continuous, advanced continuous, and discrete. And under common continuous, one of the ones that I want to highlight is Pearson family. The Pearson family allows you to specify not only the mean and the standard D, but you can add skewness and kurtosis. And it will find a distribution. Uh, uh, it looks at seven different distributions, and it will find a distribution that will satisfy those four moments. So that's uh, a useful distribution. And then if you look in the advanced list, pretty well every distribution you could ever want. And some of these are very specialized. It gives you a bigger library to, to, to choose from. And then we have our discrete distributions. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is with distribution fitting is that with 53 distributions to choose from, you have a better chance at finding a good distribution fit uh, with the data. So you may not know whether your data is a Johnson SB or a generalized gamma, but when you do the distribution fitting and you find that one of these distributions gives you the best fit, then it, we make it easy for you to then go ahead and use that. It just gives you, again, a bigger library of distributions to choose from. So to start with the basics, y equals f of x. And it's critical when you're doing a Monte Carlo simulation that you have a model to begin with. You can get that model from design of experiments, as I mentioned earlier. You can, you can have maybe a, a, some theoretical uh, based on physics, uh, based on chemistry, based on electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. You have some theoretical knowledge. Or in a transactional, there is some known relationship between profit and input costs or uh, inputs like sales and costs. It can be a simple linear mathematical equation or it can be a complex nonlinear equation. In either case, Monte Carlo simulation is very useful to uh, fully understand the relationship between inputs and outputs when the inputs are varying. We are assuming that the model is a useful model. Like George Box said, all models are wrong, some are useful. It's important to validate uh, your model. So we are making some assumptions here. The financial meltdown uh, occurred. People had models. They had uh, correlations that, based on the AAA ratings, the investments were safe investments. But obviously, some of those assumptions were invalid. And that resulted in, a, in meltdown. So again, this tool is a useful tool. But it's only going to be as useful as the model that you put into it. So there has to be a solid understanding of the relationship between your outputs and your inputs. Now, I, I know that I don't have perfect control over my input x's. So what does my output look like? Another way of saying it is, how can I quantify my risk? And basically, Monte Carlo just gives you a way of using brute force, using the computer to introduce perturbations, uncertainty in the inputs, and then running it through thousands of times to see what the output looks like. And then you can actually quantify the risk because you have a distribution uh, for your output. A little bit of background uh, where Monte Carlo was named after the Monte Carlo Casino. And here we have a simple three input. And the, uh, the transfer function is just the sum of those three inputs. So we have a normal distribution, a triangular distribution, and a uniform distribution. And what happens is that the Monte Carlo simulation generates random numbers for each of these inputs. And then for each uh, individual random number generated, those three numbers are summed up and then produce uh, an individual output point. And then that process is repeated several times. The default in Discover Sim is 10,000. But you can, of course, increase that or decrease that uh, depending on uh, whether you want a quick analysis or whether you want a more comprehensive analysis. Another very important uh, point is, what does the input distribution look like? Well, if you have theory, and I use the example for in reliability modeling, a Weibull distribution is very common. So amongst that big list of uh, advanced distributions in your particular field, you may have some known theoretical uh, distributions that can be used, and you should use those. Uh, another common choice is the normal distribution, and that's good. 
if your data are normally distributed. So you should really check and test for normality. And by the way, Sigma Excel is bundled with DiscoverSim. So that, uh, that is included at no additional cost. So you can just go in, quickly check your data for normality, and confirm using the Anderson Darling whether you have normal data or not. If the normal distribution does not work, uh, as I mentioned, one thing you can do is go ahead and use our distribution fitting tool. I won't actually be demonstrating that in this webinar, but in the case studies that we have in the workbook, we have six case studies. In the very first one, we show you how to use distribution fitting in a retail profit simulation model. Then I mentioned the Pearson family. What's nice about the Pearson family is that you can put the four moments in, and that gives you a lot of flexibility. Essentially, any unimodal distribution can be captured with these four moments. So if you know the mean standard deviousness and kurtosis, you can go ahead and use those. Now, if you do not have data, and that's often the case, we're, we're doing project management, we know what the inputs are, but it, we don't have a lot of quantitative data, we have more of a qualitative subjective knowledge of the process. We can say, what's the best case, what's the worst case, what's the most likely? In that case, you actually you have three options, uniform, triangular, and PERT. And uniform is used when you want to be conservative because you have an equal probability over the whole range. So for example, in a tolerance design situation where you get, you're getting components from a vendor and they may be using some type of test truncation, which almost guarantees uh, maybe not uniform, maybe a truncated normal. By the way, you can also you can specify truncation as well. But in, in this case, with the uniform distribution, it's the most conservative, equal probability over the whole range. Then the triangular distribution is a popular one when you have that best case, worst case, most likely. PERT is another one that's used, often used in project management. And the, really, the, the difference between PERT, PERT is based on a beta distribution, but all you have to do is specify the minimum, the mode, the maximum, or the, the minimum, the most likely, the maximum. And on the PERT, as you can see from the curve, it's placing more weight on the middle values, whereas triangular is a linear relationship up to the most likely. So it's just a a, a difference in emphasis between the triangular and the PERT. The case study examples, for example, in our workbook use the triangular distribution, and you'll see a PERT often used in project management. DiscoverSim allows you to specify uh, correlations between inputs, and this is just a nice little picture showing you what happens when you assume that this is a bivariate normal distribution, and this is a bivariate normal distribution with a 0.8 correlation coefficient. So just shows you how much of an impact. And this is something that if, if your in inputs are independent, then you don't need to worry about it. But if your inputs are correlated, it's crucial that you, you specify input correlations because you can get very different results. Uh, we also allow you a little switch that you can turn off the correlations and run your simulation or run your optimization. Uh, that way, you can actually quickly assess the impact of correlations. OK, so I want to talk about stochastic optimization. We've talked about quantifying risk. Now we want to talk about minimizing risk. Excel Solver uh, is a very useful tool, and, but it's, it's not easy to set it up uh, to do stochastic optimization. It's really a deterministic optimizer. Deterministic optimization can work well in a lot of situations, but when you're interested in not just hitting the mean or getting the mean on target, but reducing the variation, you really need stochastic optimization. And the way it works, this is actually an example from the catapult, where the x-axis is the launch angle, and the y-axis is uh, part of the equation that's, uh, that is used to determine the launch distance. And when the launch angle is 30 degrees, you can see where you are in the relationship that the transmitted variation is quite large. By simply changing the launch angle from 30 degrees to 45 degrees, you're now in the flat zone. And 
then the transmitted variation is dramatically reduced. Okay, so that's this is the in, the essentials of robust design is finding those sweet spots in the response surface, so that if there are plateaus, if there are sweet spots in the x's that reduce the variation in the y's, then you want to find those sweet spots. Then you also have another problem, and that's the issue of local optimization versus global optimization. This is illustrated with a function called the Schwefel function, and it's a trigonometric function. And in this function, you have a lot of local minima and one global minimum. So an ordinary optimizer like newton raphson depending on where you start, is very likely to just get stuck in a local minimum. You need global optimization in order to be able to find the true global minimum. So there's two issues here. One is dealing with a statistic where you can actually reduce the variation. And two is finding a, a global optimum in the presence of uh, many uh, local optimum. And you need a more advanced tool, uh, just regular optimization. I mentioned newton raphson is, is not enough. We actually use, for local optimization, we use something called sequential quadratic programming. What that is, is similar to newton raphson but it allows for constraints. Okay, so you can actually put constraints in. But for global optimization, we have something developed out of uh, North Carolina State University. Uh, Dr. Finkel, in his PhD thesis, put a very powerful optimization tool called direct dividing rectangles. And we use that. We also use the genetic algorithm. And the genetic algorithm is another popular global optimization tool. We, we put a hybrid together, which starts with the dividing rectangles, and then goes into genetic algorithm, and then fine-tuning uh, with sequential quadratic programming. This hybrid w was uh, discussed in a paper uh, by Hiwa, and their argument was that GA, genetic algorithm, is very good, but sometimes there are blind spots. And what they're saying is, for example, in this problem here, this was a genetic algorithm, and it, there, there were regions that were not considered. So by starting with the dividing rectangles, you actually do a, you, you reduce the likelihood of blind spots for the genetic algorithm. So it just gives the GA a much better chance of finding that global optimum. And then sequential quadratic is nice as a fine tuning very fast at the end within uh, the local region. I want to talk about the components of optimization, and then we'll go right in and look at a case study. You, you may be familiar with what is called the decision variable. We call it an input control, again, using Six Sigma language. So the input control is like the knob that you vary, like the, the thermostat. You control the temperature. You also have constraints. Now, our constraints only apply to input controls. A constraint cannot apply to a stochastic input distribution or to an output response. We are going to add constraints for outputs in a future release, so uh, as part of our improvements. Right now, I do want to mention that we, uh, we do permit multiple response optimization. So in a multiple output situation, you just need to set a target for each of the outputs, and then you can uh, go ahead and run the optimization to, uh, to hit all of those target values. So the constraint is very straightforward. You just put the, for the formula on the left-hand side, and then the uh, constraint, or the constant, on the right-hand side. We have uh, quite a, a list of uh, optimization metrics. And you can choose to minimize or maximize the weighted sum of various statistics. I'll mention the Taguchi loss function. Mean squared error is quite common uh, in a multiple response optimization. What it will do is we'll try to put the mean on target and reduce the variation. We have metrics such as actual DPM and calculated DPM. So actual DPM is useful if you have non-normal data. And calculated DPM, that's output data. Um, if you're expecting the output to be normal, 
uh, you can use calculated DPM. We also have percentile uh, process capability indices. So for the percentile capability indices and actual DPM, uh, we recommend that each individual uh, iteration contain a minimum of 10,000 replications so you get reliable uh, statistics uh, for those empirical metrics. Uh, you can, of course, use the classical process capability indices. We also have the desirability function. So those of you, again, who are familiar with design of experiments, if you, let's say you want to maximize output one, minimize output two, and hit a target for output three, you can do that uh, with the desirability function. The only thing about the desirability function that um, I personally am not a fan of is because it only looks at the mean. It doesn't consider the standard D. Whereas mean squared error, uh, the Taguchi loss function considers both hit the target and reduce the variation. So I like the mean squared error. Uh, also, CPM is another one that's good because CPM, uh, again, same idea, uh, hit the target and reduce the variation about target. So lots of flexibility on the optimization metrics. Uh, now we'll uh, go ahead and look at this first example uh, with permission from Andrew Sleeper uh, from his book, Design for Six Sigma Statistics. It's a, uh, a shutoff valve, and this is a cross-sectional view. And so there's a spring uh, mechanism that uh, keeps the, uh, the, essentially the inlet closed. And the spring force has to be controlled to a certain, or within a certain specification. If the spring force is too high, the valve will not open. Um, whereas if it's insufficient, uh, then it'll be it can be stuck open. Okay, so there's kind of there's a sweet spot in the spring force pressure. The details, the formula details are given here. We're not going to worry too much about the uh, the exact you know, going into all the theory, but the, the, the transfer function of, a, of interest is this spring force, and the specification is 22 plus or minus 2 newtons. All right, so we're going to uh, now switch over. And by the way, this case study uh, is in the workbook as well, so you can go through this uh, on your own. So I have a, a spreadsheet set up, and this spreadsheet is included with Discover Sim. Uh, so these are the eight different uh, features um, associated with this uh, gas shutoff valve. And we have uh, the uh, output is given here, the spring force. So the first thing I want to do is I want to define the input distributions. So I click on uh, input distribution. By the way, just this is uh, our Discover Sim menu. We have input distribution, output response. Uh, copy, paste, clear. You must use copy, paste, clear, discover sim. You, if you use Excel, copy, paste, clear, it's just not going to work. There are hidden worksheets in the background, and information is stored about these input distributions. And so if you just simply try to copy and paste, all you're doing is you're copying and pasting the formatting and for the color of the formatting information, but you're not copying and pasting the discover sim data. All right, so it's, imper it's imperative to use uh, our copy-paste clear. You have a model summary. We actually produce a model summary every time you run a simulation as well. Here's your run simulation, your distribution fitting, specify correlations. These are your optimization uh, uh, contr input controls, constraints, and here's your run optimization. So let me begin here with the input distribution. It's telling me that it's initializing the workbook. And this is our dialog box. Everything's in one dialog. So you don't have to bop around from one dialog to another. It's all self-contained. You can pick off your distribution that you want. In this case, we're going to go with the uniform distribution because we're doing a component uncertainty with uh, actual tolerances. Actually, just, just to go through here, I have advanced uh, continuous distributions. I have discrete distributions, and we can select from those. We're going to use, as I mentioned, the uniform. By the way, if you have, if you ran distribution fitting, you can then select uh, from the, those distribution fits uh, to be applied to a specific input. Okay, 
so I'm going to I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to uh, do a reference to the name, and I have it all conveniently laid out here. This is called X1 disk, and I'm going to uh, reference the minimum and the maximum. So that's again given here. It's really good to set all the stuff up, and the reason is later on, if you want to make changes to these parameters, you just go in and type in the changes and then rerun your simulation. Whereas if you just hard code the, the min, the maxes, the parameters, then you have to edit that particular input. Um, okay, so that's our minimum. Uh, notice the, the line changed to a drop down. Okay, this is telling you it's a ref edit. And now I'll go with my max. And then I can update the chart. So that's uh, my first input. Click OK. And then if I hover on it, I get a nice graphical comment. Okay, so you can you get a picture of the distribution. You can see your parameters, and it's a uniform distribution. So I've got it set up so that I can quickly do a copy and paste. If all the distributions are the same, and what's changing are the uh, parameters, then use copy and paste. If each input has a different distribution, then you're going to have to go in and manually uh, create it uh, one at a time. All right, so I'm going to do a copy cell. And then I just click, and then I'll do a paste. All right. So now I can, again, I can just hover. And this gives me all of my uh, uncertainty around these um, uh, component values. And then I'm adding a nominal value. Uh, and then I'm applying these various equations. So the, the output of interest is this spring force y. And what I'll do is I'll define that as the output. So this is our output dialog. And I'm going to call this, I'll just call this spring force. The lower spec limit, we said the specification was 22 plus or minus 2. So 20 is the lower spec limit, 22 is the target, and 24 is the upper spec limit. Uh, these settings are optional. They're really only necessary in a multiple response optimization problem where you may need to assign different weights. And in the desirability function, if you want to set specific goals, you know, just for a univariate, you don't really need to worry. You just use the defaults. So go ahead and click OK. And that's our output defined. Gives you the formula, gives you your spec limits. Now we're ready to run simulation. So I'll just go ahead and run simulation. The default is 10,000. And just go ahead and run that. And there's our, our histogram. We can see this is a process that's in, in need of improvement. All our descriptive statistics, our normality test, the data is not normal, process capability doesn't, we're not, you know, this is prob obviously a process in need of improvement. PPK of 0.4. We have expected, assuming a normal distribution, and, and by the way, of course, these capability indices also assume a normal distribution. We also have the empirical metrics that you can use uh, in the case of non-normal data. These two numbers are pretty close. Bottom line is this is a process that is in need of improvement. We have, you know, 12.8% out of spec. A few other things. I do have percentiles. If you actually, if you want to do a non-normal process capability, let's um, rerun the simulation. I add a percentile report. Okay, and if I run a percentile report and I scroll down, now I have the percentiles, and I include the 0.135, the 50th, and the 99.865. So it's easy to. Uh, compute non-normal capability in this the, the next question I have is, what inputs uh, has the greatest impact on the variability of the output? So I want to rerun the simulation. Now I'm going to add sensitivity charts. To keep it simple, we're just going to do correlation coefficients. You can go in and do full regression analysis. Um, if you want to get R squares and so forth, 
And in addition, if you want to add class terms, quadratic terms, and so forth, you can go ahead and do that as well. We'll, we'll not do that in this demo, but I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and uh, run this now with the sensitivity charts. And we'll look at the sensitivities. And we see that X5 is the uh, dominant contributor. And if I go back here, this is my initial compression. So what can I do? Well, I'm, now that I know that this is the biggest contributor, maybe we can reduce the variation of this particular uh, input X. And let's say it's not very expensive. We can actually get that variation down to plus or minus 0.25. So I'm going to go in and change that to minus 0.25 to plus 0.25. All right, so now I've reduced the variability or the tolerance associated with uh, initial compression. Now I'm going to rerun the simulation. And let's see how we do. OK, if we look at the capability numbers, and I know it's, uh, the distribution is not normal, but just to get a, a rough idea of improvement, uh, you know, we went from previous uh, capability of uh, PPK of 0.43, now 0.63. So it's a little bit of an improvement. However, it's certainly not Six Sigma quality. OK, so what do we do now? This is where optimization uh, comes in and can be very powerful, um, especially if there are those sweet spots in the uh, y equals f of x where you have this plateau that en enables you to take advantage of robust territory. In order to do the optimization, we must specify input controls. So the input control, I click here. This is where I'm, I've set the model up so that um, I'm going to turn these uh, into the input controls. And then that control value gets added to the stochastic here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead. And I'm going to uh, put specify the control. You, we allow continuous controls and discrete controls. I'm going to give this a name. And the name is called simply x1 control. My minimum will be 2. And my maximum will be 5. This is, these are the nominal values that I am now going to vary. Uh, like I said, uh, think of it as changing the temperature uh, in this case, lip height, we're going to vary from 2 to 5 in the optimizer. So I click OK. And uh, this is my uh, information associated with the control. So I'm, again, I'm going to use Discover Sims copy and paste. And we'll uh, paste that in. All right, and that gives us all of our controls. There is one more thing I want to do here. And because of tolerance overlap, Andy Sleeper in his book uh, provided us with some uh, constraints. And the constraints are given here. So x2 control must be greater than x1 control by 0.2 and so forth. So we're going to put the input constraints in. And in this case, um, I just type in x2 underscore control on the left-hand side. So one of the things that's different that we do is we treat the constraint as another object. So you actually see it in the spreadsheet. So x2 control minus x1 underscore control is greater than 0.2. All right, so I click OK. And the initial condition is true. So I can hover and just check and make sure everything is right. And we don't support copy and paste on the constraints. Typically, people aren't putting in as many constraints as they are input distributions or uh, input controls. So this one, we'll just do um, the second one, x4 underscore control. So I'm specifying the control names. Remember, constraints apply to input controls. So x4 control minus x3 control is greater than 0.35.
and I'll click OK and just check that. We're good. And then the last one, we'll add another uh, constraint. And that constraint is uh, X8 control minus X7 control is greater than uh, 0.5. So we have three different, con uh, different constraints. We now are ready to go with the optimizer. So under run optimization, I have here the optimization goal, minimize or maximize. I want to maximize. Um, I can do weighted sum or desirability. Um, my statistic, I'm going to use the process capability CPM. Now, the reason I'm going to use CPM is because it tries to uh, get the target, the mean on target, but it also adds a penalty for variation, so it's going to try to reduce the variation as well. So it's going to hit the target and reduce the variation. We're going to use the hybrid methodology. Now, to speed things up, I'm going to change the number of replications. So this is different from what's in the workbook. But I'm going to reduce the replications to 500. And I'm going to use Latin hypercube sampling. Latin hypercube sampling is uh, more exact. It's a stratified sampling. So you get a better representation than Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is more random. So uh, in a case like this, where I, I, I'm only going to use 500 replications per iteration, it's a good idea to switch over to Latin Hypercube. And then we're using accelerated mode uh, in order to uh, get this to run in a reasonable time frame. OK, so we're good to go here. Uh, we'll uh, run this now. So the first part, um, here's our CPM. We're already at 2.4. And um, that was the, uh, the original dividing rectangles. Now we're in the genetic algorithm. And it just went 2.4, 3.3, 3.74, 5, 5.4. See, it's finding, using that genetic algorithm to, uh, to find that sweet spot. And 6.6, uh, .6. bigger is better here, right? This is, uh, you know, from a Six Sigma point of view, any number greater than two is considered Six Sigma quality. So we're way beyond that. 7.15, 7.2. And it's just moving around the parameters, um, finding that sweet spot. And then the last thing it did was it very quickly went through sequential quadratic. And I'm running short of time here. So what, what I'm going to do is now I'm just going to paste these optimal values into the spreadsheet. So what it did was it overwrote the nominal values. And now I'm going to run the simulation. OK, so I'm going to get put back to Monte Carlo, 10,000 replications. And there we go, voila. We went from our, so we went from a process that was, was not capable to, um, by relocating uh, the input x factors, we now, we now have a process that is um, um, beyond Six Sigma capability. And in fact, at this point, you can do is perhaps you can go back and loosen some of the tolerances, especially if there are cost savings. You know, some of those tolerances, maybe it's expensive to have a tight tolerance. And so you can save money by relaxing the tolerance and then rerunning uh, the simulation to see what it looks like. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I had the other catapult case study, but we are out of time. That's in the workbook. Yeah, Michael uh, asked the question, do you have any case studies for transactional service processes? Yes, we have. There are actually three case studies in the workbook. One is a retail profit simulation. Two is uh, magazine production optimization. And three is picking Six Sigma projects um, with a lot of different uncertainty associated or different risks associated with the projects. You can have a look at that. Uh, the workbook actually comes when you uh, install uh, DiscoverSim. Here, you can go in and 
look at the various uh, case studies. Well, our time is up. So again, thank you folks very, very much for, uh, for your participation.